Monday. Huh? Let's go. It's Monday. I got raffle tickets. You got raffle tickets too. You got a lot to be thankful for. Amen. 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 Absolutely. That's right. We got rent. I want us to um, turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 16. We're going to read the account. Don't forget to use your Bibles. We're going to be using them tonight. Genesis chapter 16. You need a Bible one? This one no, I don't, man. No, you need your own. Yeah, that is my own. Oh, it is? Well, that's the one you gave me. Yes, sir. Ah, that's yeah. right. I'll bring it. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. Right. It's all right. You must buy it right. Buy it right. Okay. All Thank right. you. Sorry, man. It's all right. Yeah, we had to get one of those, though. <laughs> yeah, I'll take one this time. Man. Because that didn't happen last time. Okay. And you could win. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right, just hold your finger there. I want to share a couple of things on step one first. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Step one, we, um, we admitted we were powerless over the effects of our separation from God that our lives have become unmanageable. And the scripture tied into that is Romans chapter 7, verse 18. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. The recovery journey begins, okay, when we confront the very first word in step one, we. This immediately challenges the loner, isolationist in us when we are in our addictions or our sin nature and dependent on people and substances. Although we would rather we be more comfortable with the word I and we prefer to get better alone, only we can recover. Can I get any men for this? Amen. The 12-step program guides us into community where all involved are a part of each other's recovery. The 12 steps are worked and lived in a group. Independence is deadly for anybody that is an addict or in their sin nature. Actually, spiritual transformation for anyone begins in community. When Jesus began his ministry, he created a group. When we look at the church in the book of Acts, we find groups, meetings, and homes. Living in open and honest community appears to be necessary for spiritual growth, and it absolutely is. We have to accept help from others in order to recover from whatever addiction or codependency issues that we have. We admitted we were powerless, admitting that something or something has beaten us and is more powerful than our will, our own will confronts our pride. So we keep on acting out in our dependence of our sin nature, trying to prove that we can control it. By attending meetings and listening to other people's stories, we become more open to the possibility of recovery. Our pride must be shattered, a little at a time, because we will not recover without an admission of powerlessness. Our very human nature rebels at the idea of powerlessness, which signifies our inability to escape our life of dependency, addiction, in our own strength. We must let go of image-seeking and pride and tell the truth about our demoralized condition. Step one contains a potent paradox by telling the truth about our complete powerlessness over our sin nature or addiction. We receive the power of choice in return. To jump into recovery waters with both feet, we must go even deeper. Not only must we admit and accept our powerlessness over our dependencies in our sin nature, but we must also concede that our lives are unmanageable. <clears throat> this strikes a second blow to our pride and self-sufficiency. When under the influence of addictive thinking, a person believes, I can handle anything. I can fix this by myself without anyone else having to be involved. We have wanted others to believe that we have it all together, right? Everybody puts a church face on. We got it all together and are self-contained. We continue in our delusion that there should be something we can do on our own, especially to clean up our own lives. However, addiction or our sin nature leads to inefficiency in our jobs, dissatisfaction in our relationships, 
and quite often a sense that life is not worth living. Our emotional pain underscores the reality of our inability to manage our lives. I alone or pull myself up by the bootstraps mentally must give way to joining the we of recovery. We have to be rid of the just Jesus and me belief system that leads to more isolation and shame. When we realize that even God is in community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Three and one, right? That's in community right there. <laughs> I love it. We become aware of the fact that human beings were created to be connected to others. The rebel within us must now get off the throne long enough to accept the need for help from both God and others. Then we will find that God is willing to meet us in our unmanageable lives. So a lot of us don't like to ask for help. That's just the way we are. We don't want people to help us. We think that we're going to be a burden or bother them or anything like that. But really, that's not the issue. The real issue is our pride stops us from doing it. We think that we can handle it. We don't want other people to know that we're weak. And that's a problem because when you have pride in you, you cannot recover. Because the only time that we can recover is we shatter our pride and say, I need help. Now, not only do we need help from Jesus, which is our Savior, we need help from our brothers and sisters, too, Amen. that have been down the same road. That's why we have to stay in community with this, so we know that we're not, doing, that we're not falling into this problem ourselves or alone. Mm -hmm. All of us have the same condition. We all have a sin nature. We all have issues. We all need a Savior, and we all need to recover. Now, all of us need it, but not everybody wants to recover. Everybody thinks that sometimes there's other areas of my life that I don't need to put Jesus in because my life is running fine then. But no, that's not the case. We, we need Jesus in every area of our lives, and that's where total submission is, and that's where all the fruit of the Spirit comes in, and that's where the um, fullness of our salvation comes in, when we understand that God is in control of all of my life, and whatever happens, happens, and I can be stable in all of it. Because when we try to control even one area of it, and, and things start falling apart there, we become unstable in all the other areas too. Because we think that we're controlling that one when we're not. God's in control of everything. He's in control of our finances. He's in control of our family. He's in control of our brothers and sisters. He's in control of the church. He's in control of the world. And he's in control of the devil too. Remember that. Nothing can happen in your life unless God allows it. It has to go through his permissive will. And if you're one of his kids, he's doing it for a reason. And he knows the beginning to the end and we don't. Sometimes we question it and don't see a reason why we have to go through it. But he knows the outcome of it down the road we don't. He knows it's going to be better for us than if we just stay the way we are. How about an amen for that? Amen. We're stubborn people. He called his own people back in the Old Testament stiff-necked people. He says, I'm not saving you because there's anything good in you. There is nothing good in you. I'm saving you because I love you, because you're my children. That's the only reason why he's saving us. There's ain't nothing good in us. And a lot of us will still say, I'm not that bad. And they compare, we compare ourselves to somebody that really fell down into the pits. So I never went in them areas. No, but emotionally you fell in the pits too. So all of us have been there at one point or another. Amen? Amen. So none of us are better than anybody else. When we compare ourselves to Jesus, all of us fall short. None of us can be can, can measure up to that. Amen? Amen? All right, let's read step one. No win situation. And then we're going to read the account. Genesis 16, 1 to 15. We admitted we were powerless over our problems and that our lives have become unmanageable. Sometimes we are powerless because of our stations in life. We may be in a situation where other people have power over us. We may feel that we are trapped by the demands of others and that there's no way to please them at all, please them all. It's a double bind. To please one is to disappoint another. Sometimes, when we feel stuck and frustrated with our relationships, we look for a measure of control by escaping through our addictive behaviors. Hagar is a picture of powerlessness. She had no rights. As a girl, she was a slave to Sarai and Abram. When they were upset because Sarai could not bear children, Hagar was given to Abram as a surrogate. When she did become pregnant, and they, as they had wanted, Sarah was so jealous that she beat Hagar, and Hagar ran away. 
All alone out in the wilderness, she was met by an angel who gave her an amazing message. Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, You are now pregnant and will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. Genesis 9, 11. When we are caught up in no-win situations, it's tempting to run away through our addictive compulsive escape hatches. At times like these, God is there, and he is listening to our woes. We need to learn to express our pain to God instead of just trying to escape it. He hears our cries and is willing to give us hope for the future. All right, let's read the account. There's a lot here. The birth of Ishmael, chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. For she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Not a wise decision. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't like, no, 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 don't let me, please, please. Okay, I'm fine. <laughs> and Abraham agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened ten years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. Now, before we go on, the reason why Abram gave in so easily is because he was waiting and waiting and waiting on God. He was getting weary from waiting on God, so he made a decision to do it on his own because he didn't want to wait on the Lord. And this is a problem that most of us make all the time. And it causes us a lot of problems and sometimes permanent consequences. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarai with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. <laughs> Abram replied, look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. That was not a wise choice by him saying that. He put power into her hand, and that Jezebel spirit came right out into her. <coughs> then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. Now Abraham, Abram was the man of the house, and he was supposed to handle that situation. He gave the power over to Sarai, which he should have never did. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness, along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Now imagine, a lot of people are not going to do that, right? But the, the Holy Spirit, the angel, God told her to go back and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And then the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You want to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fists against everyone. Wow. And, will be, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? So that well was named Beh Laharoi, which means well of the living one who sees me. It can still be found between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave Abraham a son, and Abraham named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. 
All right, now go back to the flip of page, and I want us to look at the caption at the bottom. See, it says 16, verse 1 to 4, in the bottom there. Yeah. Let's read this now. Listen up. This is the important part of this. And then we're going to read some more. It's at the bottom of the page. It says uh, 16, 1 to 4. It's on page 22. You see it down there? Yeah, mm -hmm. got it. Okay, now listen up. Since God's promise of a child had been given, God promised Abram a child. Okay? <coughs> it was a promise that God was going to fulfill. Yeah. He did not want to wait. Yeah. About two years had passed without anything happening. Two years now. Two years passed without anything happening. Sometimes the hardest part of recovery is the waiting. We're doing a message on Sundays on waiting on the Lord because it's a very important thing that most Christians will not do. Here Abram and Sarai show us what not to do when things don't progress as quickly as we might hope. Rather than accept God's timing, they took matters into their own hands. They assigned the servant girl, Hagar, to be a surrogate mother for Abram's son. This solution has been a source of conflict to this day. Abram's descendants from Hagar are the Arab nations whose conflicts with the Jews keep the Middle East in constant turmoil. Wow. Now that consequence still lives on. Mm -hmm. God never took away the consequence from that child being born out of his will. Don't think that you can make choices out of his will and not pay a price for it. You will pay a price, and he will still fulfill his promise but there will be a consequence of pain and turmoil in your life because you went before him. I didn't mean meant for this. Yeah. Very important to yeah. wait on God. Now, turn the page. Go to look at verse 16, verse 7 to 13 now. On page 24 at the bottom. There's another important principle here. When Hagar could not help herself and recognize her powerless over her situation, the angel of the Lord came and ministered to her. Until we recognize that our situation is hopeless without outside help, God waits and does not help us. But when we are ready to admit our need and cry out to Him, He is ready to step in. Now, what's the problem? She ran away from the problem. How many times do we run away from problems instead of waiting on the Lord? And this is another thing that we do. We don't wait on the Lord and we run away from the problem instead of letting the Lord deal with it for us and inviting Him into it. You see the principles of the clearest of the, in the Bible 4,000 years ago, and we still do these things today. We still do these things, and that's why the accounts are in the Bible, to help us to understand what not to do. It tells us, if He says, if somebody's being hostile to you, that doesn't mean you run away from them. You wait on the Lord. Pray to the Lord. Say, Lord, whatever's going on in my life, you're going to handle it. You're going to make the changes. I'm going to hang in there because you have a reason why you're doing it. Jonah ran away too. Remember, he didn't want to help. He didn't want to tell uh, the Ninevites that judgment was coming. He ran the other way. He ended up suffering and struggling. Look, when God, when God wants to help us, it's going to be in His time and His way. None of us want to wait. None of us are trusting God and waiting. And it's the same problem over and over again. And that's why most of the churches are still a mess because nobody's getting taught the right stuff. Everybody thinks the blessings of Abraham. Let me tell you about the blessings of Abraham. Abraham was blessed, but he had to deal with all that other stuff too of those mistakes he made. Don't think that you're not going to deal with the consequences of your actions just because you're a Christian. He's not some fluffy God that just escapes everything. And David, the promise still went true to him, but his whole family was a mess because of the decision he made to have sex outside of the marriage and bring another one. It actually killed the kid who was dead from it. So don't think that we can make court, plot our own course and just play church. Come back and forth to church, do things our own way, and then pray to God, say, God, please help me. Say, I'm trying to help you. You won't let me help you because you're taking matters in your own hands. And then we get mad at God, say, why, God, didn't you help me? He said, I'm not here trying to help you. You won't get out of the way. You just won't get out of the way and let me work in you. When God calls us to do something, we have to admit we're powerless over it, submit to Him, and wait on Him to fulfill it. We're very impatient, even Christians. 
I see Paul and Peter and Chris not your regular people. God's got us in a season to change us, and it takes a lot to change our stubbornness. Have you not noticed how stubborn, how hard it is to change? God has to deal with that, and it takes a long time to change us. We have to admit how powerless we really are over people, places, and things. Whatever situation you're in right now, God's, got, God's put you there. And you have to look at it in a way that God wants you to see it. What are you doing in my life? Why are you putting it there? It's designed to make me like Jesus. Show me what you want and what needs to change in me, not them. We're waiting for the situation to change. When God says, no, I'm waiting for you to change, then the situation will change. Until then, it's like a revolving door. It goes away for a little bit, then it's right back in your face again. <laughs> it goes away for a little bit, then it's right back in your face again. God's saying, I'm waiting for you. Are you going to change? Or are you going to keep going? Put a big amen there. Amen. amen. Step one is awesome. I, I, I've, had, no, I've had more peace in my life realizing how powerless I am over all kinds of things. Whenever I start getting frustrated right away, I give it to God and say, I'm trying to be you. Whenever you get frustrated, listen to me. This is from your pastor. Whenever you get frustrated and angry, okay, it's because you're trying to do what only God can do. So the sooner you admit that, look in the mirror and say, I'm getting frustrated and angry. I'm trying to do what only God can do. Lord, I'm sorry. I repent. I humble myself. I'm giving this over to you now. But you have to repent because you are you're actually doing what the devil did. The devil wanted to be God. And that's wow. what you're doing when you try to take over a situation. You're trying to do what only God can do. And now you're opening the door for Satan yep. to come into your life and destroy it. Yep. Because he will. God's not going to stop you from making the wrong choice. He tells you what to do. And he tells you how to do it through his word. And the Bible shows us what not to do. And until you can admit that you're powerless in the situation and give it to God and really mean it, then he can help you. Until then... You're on your own, and you're going to struggle, and you're going to suffer all the way till you go home to be with. Depending on how stubborn you are. Is there any stubborn people in this room? Sometimes. <laughs> how many of us really hate to say that we're wrong when we're, the way we're thinking? If you look back at your life, and you look at the way God wants us to live and the way we've lived, everything we thought and done was way off. We thought we were right. We want people to think like if we were trying to mold and shape people into our own image. And it's like, this one of me is enough. One of you is enough. You do not want to bring somebody into your image. You want to bring them into the Lord. That's why it's important for you to bring them to church and bring them to the Bible and let the Bible change them. Because you can't do it. You can't even change yourself. So don't try to be a savior. Let Jesus be the savior. Bring them to the Word of God. And if they're not ready for it, that's okay. Just leave them in God's hands. Someday the brokenness will bring them. If not, don't peck, don't pester them. Just leave them alone. Don't peck at them. Don't try to give opinions. Don't do anything unless they're asking for it. Just leave them alone. And let the seed take root. It takes a while. Think of, all, think of everybody here, how long it took for the seed to take root in your life to finally get this. How long were you saying you were walking with God when you never really knew him. How many years were you following a deception? And not even think you were following a deception. So that's where people are at. A lot of people are deceived right now, and even Christians are, because they're not getting taught the Word of God. They deviate. Most churches might give you ten minutes of the Word of God. The rest is music, and activities, and things, and we're trying to go out and save the world when we're still a mess ourselves. It's like the blind leading the blind, and that's not what church is all about. First, you have to you have to become something before you can do anything for the Lord. They try to be something before they become something. That's why the step everybody should be in here. Anybody that wants to do anything for the Lord should go through this process because there's stuff that needs to get cleaned out, so He can put His love inside of us, so people can actually see it. And it ain't meant for that. Amen. So much easier to be powerless anyway. Any perfectionists in the room? How's it work, Drew? How's being trying to be a perfectionist work? It's, it's constant. It's constant misery because we can never live up to it. No. We can never live up to the expectation. 
And the worst part of all it is we expect others to. We put a standard and we think everybody else should live up to that standard too. And well, we can't even do it. And so, I'll tell you what, I'm, just a, I'm a stubborn Italian. It takes a lot to convince me of something. I get to see it over and over and over again. Still to this day sometimes, I need the proof, right? <laughs> but the Lord knocks you down all the time. My wife shows me, hey, say, say, I'm like, I don't do Like, I question my wife all the time. 99.9% .9 of the time, she's right. She's right. And I'm like, how come I didn't see that? You did. That's because she's my help. You understand? She's my help. She loves me. She's showing me what needs to be. When, they, when I'm not seeing, Amen. and I show her what she's not seeing, you see? And that's how we work together when we grow. We're not picking at each other. We're actually showing each other and trying to help each other. That's what recovery is all about. But we get mad at each other, right? We, we say something, and we take it as an insult instead of what? Constructive. We're trying to help you, and you get angry. Because the truth hurts. That's what it is. That's the truth right. hurts. Yeah. When somebody hits us with the truth, it's like... What about you? You know better than me. Yeah, this is where it goes, right? But recovery's not about that. It should be thank you. You're showing me what I couldn't see. Yeah. Because we can't see it. If we could, we would have not. We wouldn't need a problem. We wouldn't need a savior. We can't see it. And then we think we're going crazy. But we're not. We say we can't see our sins. They're blinded. Yeah. We can see something wrong with everybody else. But when it comes to picking it, what's up with us? Very, very hard. Don't worry. God will send something in your life to show you what's wrong with you. As all of you must already know, <laughs> people in your life that are really rub you the wrong way or tell you something wrong that you don't want to hear. Right? And we try to push him away, right? Get out of here. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm not, I don't want to be near you. God's saying, well, I'm the one talking to you, not him. You don't want to hear me. That's the problem. God sent him. And you're, and you're shoving him aside. And they say, wow, you don't really want to hear God. That's what it is. And God might use the devil. See, we don't understand the principle. God uses the devil too. He lets the devil have at us to change us too. So, either way, God's in control of it. Amen? And we can admit that. Life was a lot better. I'll tell you, my, my life's not perfect, but it's a lot better. I said a lot, a lot of things that I can't change. My wife will tell you. I said, she said, what's the matter? I said, there's nothing I can do. And I just stay calm. There's nothing I can do about it. She said, Calm down. It's nothing to do. We're powerless. But that's what this does. It peels layers away. I don't know how many times I did this. There's so many layers that I haven't seen about myself. As they keep getting peeled back, the more light gets on them. The layers. And then you actually see what's wrong with yourself more. What's wrong with yourself more than you see what's wrong with other people. Wow. I thought it was them. It was all the time it was me. Yeah, amen for that. Amen. It's not about she the one. All right, let's answer some questions on step one.